February 2016. And what, uh, what I will do, because time is short, so I will try just to, um, uh, to explain the historical problem uh, I have been um, facing in uh, the past few years just to show you which is the interest uh, of doing what I'm doing. So uh, I just will put in context uh, the questions uh, that I uh, was facing and hope this will be, this will stimulate your curiosity, hopefully, uh, to read uh, uh, something that is uh, about to be published, uh, a book uh, uh, on the Renaissance of General Relativity, uh, in which I, uh, to which I contributed with a chapter devoted to this problem. So, um, <clears throat> we are here in Virgo, and uh, uh, as you all know, I would say a very obvious thing. There are uh, three long-based uh, interferometric detectors in the world. Two are in the States, and one is, is, is this one. And the problem, the big problem uh, I want to point out is that uh, if you want to make detection of transient signals as the ones that have been seen so far in, since 2016 to uh, now, you need coincident experiments. You need at least two detectors. Uh, this is a, I mean, this is the nature of the phenomenon that we are uh, trying to, to search, to, that we are trying to detect. So. Uh, this means that gravitational wave detection of transient signals as uh, the gravitational uh, emission by binaries collapsing or uh, needs, this is true need, uh, needs to have at least two detectors. And of course, a question rises. Um, we have, in the States, we have two. In Europe, you have one detector. Of course, the, the first detection by LIGO and Virgo has been a great success of all the gravitational wave community. But of course, as uh, the two LIGO uh, did uh, the, uh, the, the actual detection, uh, this was of course a kind of a, it was not a full, it was not perceived as a full success. I say a uh, delicate thing, but it was not perceived as a full success by the Virgo community, of course. I remember very well Adalberto Giazzotto telling me when I asked him just a few days later the announcement, what was his first impression when, when he had, uh, when he knew about some months before about the detection. He said, well, my feeling was anger. <laughs> so, uh, of course, it was uh, not. But the problem is, why Europe? So, uh, the community of gravitational wave searches, uh, many of them pose this, uh, this problem uh, because the community is not very aware of what happened in the 80s. Uh, why today we don't have to uh, long baseline interferometers in, uh, in Europe. Why was there a chance to have now? <laughs> well, the chance was, um, was considered in the late 80s. There were some uh, um, negotiations and attempts to make uh, a collaboration between the few groups that were working in Europe. There were very, there were few, there were uh, in, uh, English group, uh, the, the British group, uh, I mean, the, the German group, then there was the, the French group, and these th three groups were working on uh, optics uh, already since the very, um, some from the middle of the 70s, and the, the French one from, uh, from the beginning of the 80s, on optical problems to uh, with, with, uh, with the aim of making uh, an, an interferometric detector, so using a new kind of, uh, of detector uh, for, um, for gravitational wave uh, detec detection. So the problem 
was, uh, and, and then there was a fourth group that was not an optical, an optical group, as you know, it was the Italian group from Adalberto Giazzotto that was working on another problem. They were working on seismic isolation, that is uh, the, um, a great success uh, of Virgo, of course, a very original and great success uh, of Virgo, as you have seen, you have visited this morning. I hope you enjoyed, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, this morning in Virgo. However, <clears throat> so there was these four groups, and the optical groups had some uh, kind of collaborations in, 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 in Europe since uh, the 1983, 1984. They have asked for funds, European funds, to make a project together. The idea was to have, um, to have at least two, but uh, hopefully also three gravitational, uh, interferometric gravitational um, interferometers in, in Europe, so to be uh, in some way uh, on, on the edge, on the frontier of science, as they have been uh, during, because you know, the, the European groups were really uh, at the frontiers, they were the most uh, uh, advanced in interferometric studies at the time, and that, that is a fact. <laughs> so, uh, because the, 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 the Okay, I will, go, I will go just a little bit. Uh, so, this is the question I am looking at. And uh, uh, there is also another point of interest. Can we learn something from the history uh, to, uh, to be used today that we are, uh, that new projects are being considered to make a, a truly and uh, a European born project for the next generation of gravitational wave detectors. So this is, this is the problem, addressed by the community, by the gravitational wave community. So, okay, this, um, I've been studying uh, papers from the archi archives uh, since uh, uh, several years and uh, making many, of course, interviews, but the most part of my, uh, of my research work came from the archive of Alain Barillet and Adolberto Giazzotto and from Namarco Napolitano, who in the late 80s was in a, an important position inside the INFN Council when the approval um, of Virgo uh, was, uh, was coming about. So, as you know, um, <clears throat> there have been three big uh, generations of gravitational detectors. The pioneers, uh, the pioneer, of course, is Joe Weber with his Crisonon bars, and this was room temperature bars, uh, first generation. The second generation is considered to be the cryogenic uh, bars, so cooling down Weber's uh, bars uh, up to um, very close to the absolute zero. And then we have a big jump for the, something really uh, a big jump in scale from the cryogenic bars up to uh, the interferometric bars, so the, the, uh, to, to the interferometric antennas that are uh, that is like like really going live, of course. And this is the third generation. And now we are speaking about since 2004. Uh, and one of the promoters is, is, is here in Virgo, he is Michele Ponturo, of this idea. The idea of a third, third generation interferometric detector, uh, Einstein telescope, that uh, it is an idea and it is being negotiated and uh, discussed. Uh, also, now this year has been the 10th, I think, symposium about Einstein telescope, a huge. Uh, in interferometer with three three arms that uh, that um, is born as an idea for European collaboration. So a truly for European born European collaboration, not so not as big as that has uh, was born as an Italian French collaboration. Yeah, I will just. Uh, so the second generation detectors uh, for interferometric detectors. Uh, as you know, I have been the one that uh, had success in, in detecting uh, gravitational waves. 
And every time you have to accelerate science from one generation to another, of course there are many efforts, and I made this parallel, you know, this is oh, uh, part of my study, of course, uh, uh, as the, the, three, the two different um, steps of generation. So you have the uh, room temperature resolvers on the bars, the cryogenic resolvers on the bars, and the interferometric detectors, but then you have this uh, uh, parallelism with the generation of interferometric detectors, which now we are at the second generation advanced interferometric detectors, and we, we will go to the future ground-based detectors as Einstein telescope, and we hope, of course, that uh, this will happen soon. Just to show you the, the change in scale, because the problem is that, as uh, you see, uh, between the... Yes. Between the second generation and the third, I said there was a big jump from uh, cooling bars to interferometric antennas. And the, sa the same jump, uh, maybe also bigger, uh, is from this to this. A jump that is, is not only uh, economic, because we are speaking about a project, Ettore was telling us before, Einstein Telescope, 1.5 billion uh, euros. But it's also uh, a jump in the number of people uh, working on it. And it, it was uh, exactly the same for this passage here, when there were just few groups made uh, that um, uh, just five, four, six people, not more. And then you go here, when you see that the community enlarges and uh, becomes a community of about 1,000 and more uh, people. So, uh, just to show you, this is this is the you see here. This is Explorer. This is Explorer. Is the most the, the, in the 90s? It was the most uh, for, for a couple of years. It was the, the most sensitive gravitational wave uh, bar, uh, the, the uh, resonant bar, and cryogenic bar. It was at CERN, and you see how much uh, the scale has changed, of course, respect to the new generation. Just to give you an idea. However. What I wanted to just show you, this is a, a, little, a little timeline about the groups uh, uh, that were active in the uh, 70s and 80s working on the idea of uh, uh, interferometric detectors. You see the, the Garching group in Germany and the uh, British group in Glasgow began at the same time. Inosé, Alain Brier began his activity about at the early 80s. In Pisa, also the activity on seismic uh, isolation began some, some years, uh, so, so just uh, around 82, 83. And then, and then we have the, at the end of the, yes, the, uh, the, the middle of the 80s, you have the first the, the, the request for the grants, okay, I'm finishing, for the grants, European grants from the three optical groups, so French and uh, uh, German. And British. So I will not. I will skip all the, the description of the birth of these groups, just to show you what happened. There were many meetings to try to make a collaboration, a European one, uh, and uh, to because it was very. I mean, it was also a, a good idea to present themselves to the funding agencies in each uh, in each country and to the European. Uh, commission to present all these groups together to say there is this community we want to have at least two uh, European uh, gravitational wave detectors because this would put us in a very good position to detect and study gravitational waves once they have been detected to make to open gravitational wave astronomy and they made a document at the end of uh, many uh, Discussions, uh, which I will not speak today, in which you can read that the European groups agreed to form a collaboration. This is uh, the 1988 report from this ad hoc working group on the future of interferometric wave antennas. It was signed by the people uh, you see from uh, the, the, the groups, the European groups from the four countries. All members of the collaboration will work towards establishment uh, to establishing the best possible European network with the aim of establishing a gravitational uh, astronomy. 
uh, it must be reasonable, European goal, to build three detectors. Such a network would be capable of providing extremely useful scientific information on its own, regardless of what happens in the world. Of course, what was happening, uh, of course, also LIGO, the LIGO project was going on. They had, uh, as the European, uh, they had their problems in, in finding, in, in trying to convince the funding agencies to, to be, uh, to, to, to to be funded, of course, and so it was a, a strange balance and some uh, between the different groups in the world because they were there was competitiveness, of, of course, they were competitive, but for the reason of the nature of the signal to be detected, it had to be also a collaboration because collaboration is connected <laughs> to is strongly <laughs> connected to detection of gravitational waves. So. Of course, this is a great issue. Collaboration is a great fundamental issue of gravitational wave detection. So you can read in this uh, very nice report that uh, European science should, can capitalize on its past investment as they were working, uh, the German and the British uh, groups, since the, 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 the 70s, and they have been really doing uh, cutting-edge uh, development uh, that has been very useful for Lyman, for vehicle, for both, also to have the approval but from the, the funding agencies. So it was really, uh, they, they wanted to capitalize, of course, on their past investment and present scientific and technological and, 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 and um, so, and maintain their present scientific and technological uh, lead, of course. So what did go wrong? I don't have <laughs> time to go in detail, but I can uh, I can say just this: there was some, uh, there was of course some scientific disagreements that were really uh, that uh, described very well different <coughs> approach from uh, of the French and Italian group to to experiment uh, with respect to the uh, to the uh, British. And, uh, and German group, uh, and uh, and this tells us in some way how why it was easier for the British and German then uh, help and go and enter in the collaboration with LIGO and not with Virgo, for example, because this is what happened. There was a difficult balance, of course, between national ambitions and international collaboration. And there was another big, big issue is the difficult transition I was trying to uh, describe before from the bench top experiments that were, uh, up, I mean, the bench top optical experiments on interferometry, but also the small, relatively small experiments on uh, with bars, uh, and the transition to big international collaboration. The, these people, these uh, scientists who were working in that field were not very expert about big collaboration, at least uh, uh, most, most of them, <laughs> I mean, so. And uh, also the absence at that time of something like the Gravitational Wave International Committee, a context of, uh, in which uh, creative collaboration the absence of this, the absence of, for example, uh, international gatherings expressly devoted to gravitational wave community, this was not yet there in the late 80s. This begins uh, in the middle of the 90s. This was, of course, something that did not facilitate. So if you wish to know more about this, <laughs> this story, I just suggest this. Uh, uh, this book that is about to be published, uh, it is in the series Einstein Studies, the editors are uh, Roberto Lalli, Jürgen Rehm, and Alexander Blum. It is devoted to the Renaissance of General Relativity and Context. I contributed with a chapter that is uh, on, on these subjects, and so it's much. <laughs> so thank you for your attention and your patience. Thank you for the best promotion. We have 30 cycles, there is a very. So there is no. Nothing. <laughs> so if you want to look now from this to the past, we are done. Thanks so much. Wow.